Hi, this is Derek Murphy. I'm going to talk about plotting your novel and structure. Specifically, I wanted to have some kind of a step-by-step, chapter-by-chapter plot outline template um, that reader, uh, authors could use to kind of figure out how their plot fits together. And the problem is when you search for things like plot outline, what you usually get actually is some kind of a structure, um, which looks something like this. This is the best um, graph or collection of different fiction strategies and structure um, that I've found. It kind of pulls everything together and it lists all the different terms and, uh, terms and terminology, which is really useful because there's a whole bunch of different systems for plotting and structure and story architecture. And sometimes they use different words or sometimes they're almost talking about the same thing, but not quite. So this is a really good graph that kind of pulls it all together. The main problems, even though it's really good, um, is that it's still a little bit vague, and it's only really talking about the major plot points um, in a novel. So if you count up these different elements, um, in this graph there are 11 different elements. And the problem is the largest elements, um, just about 50% of the novel, are still unplanned or unscripted. So you have a beginning, some stuff happens, and then these five points, call to adventure, crossing the threshold, the midpoint, inmost cave, um, and seizing the sword, those aren't really sections, those are really just scenes. So great, that's five big important scenes you need to have in your novel, but what about all the other stuff? This part here is 50% of the novel, and so this 25% is just you know, it could be fun and games, resistance and struggle, action and obstacles. There's so many things that could go in here. And same with um, this second 25%. It could be the Dark Knight of the Soul, the Abyss and Revol uh, Revelation. Um, there's just so many things. It's not really clear, you know, what do you actually put in your novel? It's also kind of confusing just because there's so many different terms and plans um, and strategies. When I started writing fiction, I really wanted something simpler. So this is the one I came up with a few years ago that's a plot dot. This is just kind of basically boiling down um, the hero's journey. These are the eight points that I think are really important. I tend to focus more on plot points, on things that actually happen rather than the internal journey of the character. They're both important, but I like my stories, especially because I write young adult fiction and uh, sci-fi and fantasy. The plot generally um, is more important than the character development or the internal journey. But for a long time, I really wanted to have kind of a template that had more than this, because only eight points, that's not really enough to make a chapter-by-chapter -chapter outline. Today, I was reading um, Save the Cat Writes a Novel, I think it's called. It's the new Save the Cat. Save the Cat is kind of a classic screenwriting strategy. Um, so they put out a new book that's just for writing novels, and that's what this stuff is up here. These are some of the images I pulled from the Kindle version. And I really like these graphics because it simplifies a lot of things. A lot of this stuff down here, it's the same thing basically up here, um, but it's simplified. It can actually be a little misleading though, because these are all kind of the same length. And actually some of these are just um, scenes or ideas that need to happen, but they're not really uh, an accurate portrayal of how many words they're going to be. This is actually 25%. Um, this first half is 25%. The second half is 25%, um, and this one's 25%. And so again, this middle is usually the tricky part because a lot of people get stuck in the middle and they don't really know what happens and they have to fill in the space. So this whole section is kind of um, exploration of the B story, which is the character's internal story, and then all the exciting, cool stuff that happens when the protagonist is developing their powers or learning about the new world or meeting new characters kind of discovering who they are and their role in this new world. But those are really just, you know, a few indicators or markers. It doesn't really tell you what to put um, in those sections. This is a whole 25% of a novel. Um, same with this second part, which is the other 25%. The Dark Knight of the Soul, the All is Lost, those are really moments. They're not even scenes. Um, same with the midpoint. So all of this stuff, you know, bad guys close in is, is what really has to stretch for the whole 25% of that section. And then this final section is probably going to resolve um, pretty quickly, actually. So even though this whole thing is a great system and strategy to give you some organization, 
and is a 15 point um, step by step process. So that can be really helpful. It's not really a chapter by chapter outline. The closest thing I found when I was searching was this one from Katie Tastic, who is a YouTuber. And I was really attracted to the layout because I love how there's, you know, it, it's broken down into clear sections. Um, each section has an equal number of chapters. And this is like a 27 chapter outline, which is awesome. And she has a great YouTube video where she walks um, through this whole process uh, that she uses to write novels. One of the largest drawbacks, however, um, is that the acts are all equal length. So each of these acts is nine chapters, which, which is symmetrical. So it looks great um, on a graph. The problem is act two is twice as long as act one and act three. So actually act two should be 18 chapters. And I think this is why a lot of writers struggle with their novels because they get stuck in the middle. And even if they're following, you know, all of the guides or all the plot outlines, none of the, the plot outlines that are out there or the structure really explain what to fill act two with like how does act two go together so there's usually a point where they get stuck in the middle because they know there's not enough stuff happening and they're not ready to get into act three yet um but you know plotting or outlining um or building your story architecture didn't work well enough because most um writing systems don't adequately fill out the details for the second act so i was um, pretty excited today when i took my Uh, plot dot system, which is here, and tried adding three chapters for every main point on that graph. And I've just laid it out really quickly um, in Word. I picked some headers that seem to fit each chapter um, a little bit better. Over here in the navigation, you can see that I have 25 chapters, and I'm using some common terminology that might be familiar from other systems. I kind of had to mash up a few different systems um, to get something that I think is workable for most commercial fiction. I also made some little notes about you know the kind of thing that happens in each chapter. And since it came together pretty well, I went ahead and made up um, a mock-up in Photoshop of what it all looks like, um, which is here. So this is a useful graph. I don't think there's been something quite like this before. I love how symmetrical it is. You can see in red, I have um, the eight dots that I've taken from the plot dot um, graph that I made earlier. So these are the eight major turning points. Um, and I also like that I'm pretty sure I can make a strong argument for this A story, which is the external um, influences or factors that happen to the protagonist, and the B story, which is the internal stuff, the changes um, that the protagonist goes through. And you can divide them up where the A story is here, all of these um, incidents that happen or fights with the, the enemies, it's the external conflict. Um, and then the B story down here is the internal conflict. There's still stuff happening, but these points are more about the character's personal development um, and the changes they're going through. So I like how this A story and B story are really clear and linear. Like I said, Act 2 needs to be twice as long as Act 1 and Act 3, so that's why I really like that I have, you know, two main um, distinctions between the first half of Act 2 and the second half of Act 2. I think this is a pretty strong um, way to map out most commercial fiction. So I'm going to go ahead and try to walk you through um, this whole outline and how I think, you know, it should be done. I'll also share a link somewhere if you want to download that Word document that I made um, to actually use it. I'm going to try to fine tune it and add maybe a paragraph of description for each, each section so it's really clear what kinds of things could happen there. I'd even like to make like a bullet point of suggested um, scenes that could happen in that section. Um, and I'm actually going to go back to this document because I have some notes that I think will make it a little clearer. I wanted to get this down to one page. Right now it's three pages, but I may try to redesign it or something so it can all fit on one page. I'm not really going to talk about characterization or motivation or setting or description. This is kind of just a, a rough plot outline so that you can think about what kinds of things need to happen in each chapter. So in the first chapter, you want to introduce the ordinary world and build empathy um, with the main character and also introduce conflict right away. 
Generally, this is done by having a really bad day. So you introduce the normal character, um, what they want, a problem that they have, um, and what they actually need. This is what I took from Jessica Brody's um, Save the Cat book, which I've read today. I think this is a really important thing to set off from the beginning. So the main character wants something, but they run into a problem trying to get what they want. So whatever they're after, this is what the normal self in the normal ordinary world um, is after that particular day. But they run into a problem or a conflict immediately, trying uh, which stops them or prevents them from getting what they want. And that also illustrates the need. So the need is what the character actually needs to learn, but isn't self-aware enough yet to realize it. So this doesn't really have to be spelled out, but for whatever reason, the problem also shows um, the character's lack or the flaw, the fatal flaw, or the shard of glass. So the shard of glass is that um, maybe healed trauma, something happened a long time ago, it's a character flaw, it's then healed over so much they don't even recognize that it's there, but it's um, causing them perpetual harm. So this is why I call it a really bad day, because um, something's going to happen that is bad for them, um, is negative, they view it as negatively. It also shows the readers, it can build sympathy with the main character, but it also shows the readers um, that the main character is missing something. They're maybe a little bit not self-aware. In chapter two, something peculiar will happen. So this is something that's unusual for the ordinary world. It doesn't fit in the character's main worldview. So they'll probably dismiss it or ignore it. Um, readers might be clued in, like you can say that it happens, but the main character is too distracted or too busy thinking about other things or trying to get fulfill this want or deal with this problem um, to really recognize the full repercussions of what this means. In chapter three, things are really starting to fall apart. So whatever they wanted is, is they're not having success. The problems are worsening. They're feeling more and more um, pressure. They're still trying to regain control and get back to that, you know, original thing that they were worried about before. But there's all this new stuff um, coming up, which is distracting them from the ordinary world. It could also be that there's something peculiar, whatever happened, um, is kind of like a peek into a potential different world. And for contrast, they may, you know, they may think they want this one thing, but now that they've got a glimpse of this whole other universe, um, they may feel a pull or desire towards something else. They may have just always assumed like their life is planned out for them, um, their decisions have been made, they don't really have any freedom. So this something peculiar, maybe something like a splinter, it kind of gets under their skin and makes them a little itchy and uncomfortable, it makes them second guess their choices, it might make them critical of the ordinary world and their ordinary world um, relationships but they're not going to be honest with themselves yet. Um, they still want to hold control. They still want to get back to their, you know, the former selves that they're comfortable with. And then there's going to be another incident, an exciting incident or call to adventure. So this could be a literal invitation from somebody else um, leading them towards a new path that uh, they didn't expect. It could be just um, an event that they can't ignore, something really serious, something really major. If it's a thriller or a murder mystery, this could be a dead body or an explosion. Or it could be a, um, a major setback. Maybe that thing that they wanted before, maybe they just can't get it. Like whatever they were hoping for, um, a relationship, a new job, getting into a school, the door closes firmly. So everything that they wanted before, the, the future that they had mapped out for themselves, it's just gone. Um, this could be their fault. It could be um, an accident, maybe if something peculiar is like the new mysterious stranger with paranormal um, powers, it could be their fault. So here they get the, um, the invitation or the call to adventure. They're seeing the other world that exists. Um, they still want to go back to what was before, but they can't. So it's kind of an encroachment. Um, the new world, the magical world, or just the new character, the newness, whatever, um, it's kind of foiled their plans. They might be really angry, at the new world or the new character or the invitation. So the thing that they, they originally wanted, um, they can't get it, or maybe they're still trying to get it. They're still trying to solve those initial problems from the first couple chapters. Um, they're just refusing to accept the new invitation or the new call. At this point, probably um, 
you can be building uh, supernatural suspense or tension or mystery or intrigue. You can kind of be like revealing some of the new characters, but the protagonist is going to put their head in the sand. So they they just don't want the new world, uh, the new opportunity. They want to go back to how things were before. So there's a little bit of regret or doubt. Um, but at the same time, there's now a new dissatisfaction with the ordinary. They're too distracted by this new stuff that happened. Um, they can't just go back to being ordinary and normal um, and content with the status quo. If this is something like a private investigator or a crime thriller, this would be some kind of a big um, terrorist attack maybe. They would be invited to take the case. Um, they would refuse the case in the beginning but then something else would happen that pulls them forward. So they resist the invitation of the call. They don't want to do it. Um, they never really choose. That's why I use pull out rug because they don't really choose to go forward. Something rips them out of their comfort zone um, and forces them. Like even if it's kind of a conscious decision, it's because they, they have nothing else. Um, they have no other options. Maybe like they didn't want to take the case, but they needed money. Um, because something else happened, some other problem or accident, or they're trying to take care of somebody else. Um, so suddenly, like, they have to take um, the job, or they're kidnapped or transported, um, or, you know, maybe personally invested, maybe, like, they didn't want to get involved, but then the bad guys take, um, take something they care about. Maybe it's a kidnap of a loved one or, or the killing of a pet. Um, somehow they're personally motivated, and they have to get involved even though they don't really want to. Oftentimes, this is a complete um, change of scene. This is all the ordinary world. And then from Act 2, or the first plot point, this is a point of no return. So sometimes they actually go to a new magical world. Um, this is Harry Potter going to Hogwarts. It could be um, just a new relationship or a new status, like a new job or a new arrangement. But from this point in Act 2, even if they're in the same place, even if they're in the same, you know, home or family, their day-to-day -day life is going to be different. They're going to have um, new surroundings and um, circumstances that they have to kind of get used to, a new role that they're going to have to kind of prove themselves in. So the first chapter is going to be um, enemies and allies. It's also important, kind of by the first plot point, that you should have already introduced most of the main characters, even um, the antagonist who you may not meet later. There should still be a little whiff of the antagonist. Um, but the main characters that are going to be presented in the novel should mostly already be present. So in the new world, they're going to have enemies and allies. The enemies is not really like the main antagonist or the bad guys. Um, this could be other people on the new team or on the good guys alliance um, that just doesn't think they belong there. They're going to meet some fear and skepticism. They might meet some, some bullying or hazing. Maybe other people are threatened by them being, you know, uh, taking a new role in this new world. But they're also going to meet some new allies or mentors or guides. Um, there's probably a new love interest in a lot of um, young adult paranormal. The something peculiar will probably be the hot, mysterious guy with powers. Um, the call to adventure will be that hot guy comes back and tells them, you know, they're special. And then over here, that hot guy is going to introduce them to the new world. It doesn't have to be a guy. It could be a guy or a girl. Um, but like someone from the other world brings them into the world. So they have a guide. It may or may not be the love interest, but they have some kind of a new relationship. Um, with someone who knows more about the world and can kind of lead them through and explain things to them. In chapter 8, there's going to be games and trials. Jessica Brody calls this um, the promise of the premise. I thought this was a really good term. So basically anything that, like the most cool, interesting stuff that your new world has to offer, that's what you're going to be showing off here. So this might be the new um, powers. This might be the the main conflict between the love interests. This is where the protagonist is learning about this new circumstance or new world. So they're meeting all the new characters, they're learning um, the rules of this new world. It's not all fun and games. Often it's some kind of training. Maybe there's this, you know, a supernatural war going on and they have to learn how to 
harness their powers. So they might be like going to class or meditating or learning to control their emotions. It might also just be the epic world building where they're discovering this fantasy um, civilization. They probably um, have a lot of frustration and self-doubt. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like they're good enough. They might feel inferior, um, out of place. But then gradually in chapter nine, um, they will earn some begrudging acceptance and respect. So even from the enemies, um, they'll kind of prove themselves. Even maybe not, you know, they may not do amazing things. They may not control their powers, but in some little small way, they have a, a little victory because, you know, they're not as incapable or hopeless um, as some other people want them to be. So they kind of prove that they do belong here. So after chapter nine up here, where the protagonist has kind of reached a new status quo where they're sort of getting the hang of this new world and feeling a little bit more confident, like they understand what's going on, they've built some relationships and some friendships to kind of earn their place. And then we have the first pinch point or the first battle. This is probably where the forces of evil um, make themselves known. And this could also be um, a threat to the new status quo that they've been developing. So they're just starting to feel like they belong in this new world. Um, and then they realize the full extent of the threat against them. There's danger that they didn't um, expect. There's a rising darkness or um, evil villains. They might be threatening the protagonist directly or just threatening the, the new circumstances of the protagonist. Maybe um, it, through this point, the protagonist and the team, the forces of good, are they're starting to have missions and they're starting to go out and, and do things. Um, and they're going to come up against the antagonist. Generally, the antagonist and the protagonist kind of have the same goal. They're after the same thing. This could be a surprise attack. This could be a new player on the board. Um, but mostly, this is just a raising of stakes. So for the first time, the protagonist really understands what they're involved in um, and the dangers. Um, this might be an attack. It might be a face-to-face -face conflict. It might be indirect, like an attack on you know another city or another settlement um, where the protagonist and the allies are not, but it's part of the larger community. Um, it's also going to be a much clearer picture of the real antagonists and what the antagonists are after. So this kind of humbles the protagonists because they felt like they were kind of getting a handle on things up here in earning respect. Um, and then down here they feel overwhelmed again. And also they realize how much they didn't know. So in the aftermath of chapter 10 is the problem revealed. Probably the um, forces around the protagonist, the other good guys, they already knew this stuff. They already knew the full threat. Um, they just didn't tell the protagonist everything. So she's feeling left out or misunderstood or like she doesn't belong. She'll probably confront um, one of the allies or the mentors. They've been keeping secrets from her. I keep saying her as a protagonist, but it could be him or her, of course. Um, and so what's probably going to happen after the protagonist attacks or after the antagonists are revealed, um, the protagonist is going to demand answers. They're going to confront the allies. Um, they're going to demand to be fully let in on all the secrets. Um, and even maybe they, you know, she's been told, you know, you're not ready, you haven't developed your, pa your powers, or this doesn't concern you. Um, and so she's going to demand her, her place. If this was a romance, this could be something, the forces of evil could be something like an ex-girlfriend or, or some competition. Or it could be some um, conflict, some baggage from the love interest background um, that really changes how she feels about him. In a romance up here in um, Games and Trials and Earning Respect, they would kind of be going, growing closer. There would be some flirty, uh, tender moments. Neither one of them would really admit to, to liking the other one yet, but they would have this developing bond. Um, and then the forces of evil, it would be some kind of um, new realization. Maybe she was starting to think that he liked her, that they had a chance or something. She was starting to respect and like um, him, the love interest. But then it's kind of all shattered and broken when there's this new um, change in understanding. And so in 11, 
it's the problem um, revealed, it's a surprise problem or situation, and it's also demanding answers. So here at 12, discovering ultimatum, there's probably going to be some really critical new piece of information that changes the protagonist's whole worldview. It kind of changes everything. Now they know the full um, extent of the antagonist's forces. They know the backstory of the problem. Um, they know what they're really up against. They might also find some critical flaws in the allies' forces. So maybe they thought, you know, they were with the, the good guys, or they thought the love interest, you know, was a, a charming, handsome guy. And now they see this is actually a really complex situation. Maybe the antagonist um, has kind of a sympathetic point of view. There's a the bunch of history that they weren't let in on before. Now they kind of fully understand um, everything that's going on, and they have to make a decision. So down here I wrote vulnerable share because this is like maybe they, they didn't get the full picture before, but now, you know, a, an ally or another character, maybe a love interest or just um, somebody, um, it, it doesn't have to be the mentor or like the leader or the teacher. It could just be a, another student or a peer or an ally who's kind of just filling in the blanks and, and really telling the protagonist um, everything. And they have to decide whether or not they're actually in. They're really committed um, going forward with, with eyes open. And so this is the shift that's called the midpoint. Um, and the, the idea is that they go from victim to warrior. For the first half of the book, I'll go back here. So this whole half, um, they've been reactive. They've been learning, but they've mostly been passive. They haven't been making decisions or taking action. Um, they've kind of been reluctantly getting used to the new world. At the midpoint, they deliberately make a conscious decision to go forward, even though they know the risks, even though they know um, the backstory, they're going to stop being a victim and start being a warrior, which just means they're going to start um, taking action and being a, a more active character. This could also be um, another big revelation. A midpoint is a really good place for a surprise twist. So if this is a mystery or a thriller, um, this might be where they discover the identity of the antagonist. Uh, maybe it's a surprise. They might discover the extent of the conspiracy against them and how deep it goes. So they're probably going to second guess, you know, do they really want to be involved in this conflict? Are they the right person? They might have some self-doubt. Are they strong enough? Um, and in a lot of cases, they take a literal look in the mirror. Um, and there's a book called right from the middle by james scott bell it's a really good book just on this midpoint um but they're gonna have this kind of mirror stage where they look at themselves um, now that they have full understanding of everything that's going on they're gonna make a deliberate choice um, to move forward so this might be a re-evaluation of themselves they may have to um, confront their weakness or think about like who they've always been, who they define themselves as, what kind of person they want to be. So chapter 12 was the in and out ultimatum. Chapter 13 is the in. They decide to um, go forward. They decide they're all in. And so they formulate a plan of attack. Whatever this big problem was in 11, um, in 14, they're going to figure out what to do next, what to do about it. Maybe they have to try to stop the antagonist from doing something. Um, maybe they don't quite know, you know, what the antagonist's plans are. Maybe they're still trying to track down, if it's a murder mystery, they're still trying to track down um, the killer. They probably, at this point, even though I said at the midpoint, um, they discover the full identity of the antagonist, sometimes this is kind of a red herring where they think they know who the real antagonist is, um, but that's going to be um, untrue, actually. So based on their limited knowledge, um, they're going to make a plan of attack. Or they're going to do something to try to solve that problem. They're going to take action um, and try to get around that problem. In 15, once they've kind of mapped out their strategy or their plan, the protagonist will be given a crucial role. This is important because the other characters um, are trusting the protagonist which means previously the protagonist has been resisting responsibility, so they don't really feel any personal guilt. Um, and if you want a really uh, 
develop the emotional angst and the conflict, you need the main character to be personally responsible for things so that they can feel guilty later. It also just shows that the other main characters um, are trusting the protagonist, they're, they're letting her into their inner circle, um, they're relying on her. So everything before was basically practice, but it hasn't really been, she hasn't really been proven yet. So this is also the hero's chance to prove himself to his new peers and be really tested in the real world. In 16, we get to the second battle. And so the first battle, this one's probably kind of an accident where the antagonists probably don't know who the main character is. They haven't really met before. They, they under, underestimate um, the main character and possibly the other allies. Also, the, um, the bad guys were probably like low level henchmen at this point. So they might have had something to do with the antagonist, but they were just doing the antagonist bidding. They weren't really going after um, the protagonist or possibly the other allies. They might have just been doing the things that the bad guys do. But um, in the second battle, the forces of good, the allies, are really going to put themselves out there. So even if it's kind of a surprise attack, um, they're going to run into some higher level baddies. So it might be a lieutenant or a commander or someone with a little more agency, maybe the antagonist second in command. There's going to be a lot more risk. This could be like an infiltration scene where they're going to sneak into um, the antagonist's lair or go try to steal something that the antagonist wants or needs. They may not, you know, want to be caught or want to be revealed, but um, because they're opposing the forces of the antagonist, um, they're going to directly come in conflict with the antagonist forces, which also means the antagonists are kind of going to see who they are um, and be, their identities will be revealed. In 17, there's a surprise failure. So whatever they were planning um, didn't work. It probably was based on faulty information or an assumption. Over here where they made the plan of attack, it was based on some information, um, but it was a limited information. So maybe the realization or discovery they made at the bid point was untrue, actually. So their plan fails. This could be because there's a mole or there's um, a traitor in their midst. The antagonist might have seen them coming, or it could just be an accident, like they tripped an alarm or something. There's also going to be real consequences here. Um, because they failed, something they lose something. It could be um, they lose another character, somebody dies. It could be somebody else got really hurt or injured, um, hopefully permanently disfigured. They only had like one plan in 14. They had one idea. It was make it or break it. Um, and because they failed, they've lost that chance. So they're kind of starting over from scratch. 18 is a good place for a shocking revelation. So because they learned that their information was flawed, they may also figure out um, something else. So maybe the antagonist's full plan or true identity. Maybe they overhear the bad guys talking about something. Um, or they get a tip or a clue, but they realize um, what they did wrong and they probably understand the antagonist's true identity. So before I said um, at the midpoint, they might think they know who the antagonist is or what the antagonist wants. Um, here they would figure out who the antagonist really is or what the antagonist um, really wants. The stakes are raised. They're also going to feel guilt and anger. They're going to be angry at themselves. They're going to be angry at the, the antagonist who outsmarted them or got away. The protagonist is going to feel um, personally responsible and like they let everybody else down. And so that leads us into the second plot point, which is the Dark Knight of the Soul or the beginning of Act 3. And this is going to start with the, anti with the protagonist basically giving up. The protagonist um, loses their confidence, they underestimated the antagonist, their plan didn't work, and they lost that one shot of getting it right. So now they have no idea how to foil the antagonist's um, plans. Whatever hope they had, whatever um, they had wanted to achieve, it's all gone out the window. 
the protagonist is going to feel powerless, they're going to feel like a failure, um, they're going to self-doubt. They're probably going to feel like somebody got hurt because of them. So uh, they might say things like, I don't want anybody else to get hurt because of me, because I'm not good enough. If this is a romance, they might be feeling really vulnerable. Maybe they put themselves out there. Um, this second battle and stuff, if it's a romance, um, it might be they, you know, take a step towards, I kind of forgot to say that up here, at the midpoint, which is the self-realization stage, um, the protagonist may realize they have developed feelings for the love interest, and they may admit to themselves um, how they feel. And so through this, you know, conflict battle stage, um, they, they may execute a plan to, you know, tell their true feelings to to bear their hearts and souls. So maybe they go to the love interest house um, to confess their true love, and then they find that the love interest is with another girl. And so, you know, it's a surprise failure and they run away. Um, they're gonna feel like whatever they wanted or whatever they had dared to let themselves hope um, is now uh, no longer possible. In chapter 20, they would get a pep talk or encouragement from an ally. This could be a vulnerable share. Um, this could be like an anecdote or uh, a new revelation about one of the main characters, maybe the love interest or maybe just one of the, the allies. It could also be a new revelation about the protagonist's history. Um, maybe the mentor tells the protagonist something about um, her true identity or her true self or her parents, um, like what really happened to her parents. The protagonist basically no longer believes in themselves, and so somebody else has to give them some confidence and pull this them out of this deep depressive cycle. The other way I've seen this um, get talked about is with the phrases fatal flaw or glass shard. Basically, the protagonist has a blind spot or a personal uh, limitation that they can't see themselves. And that's probably why things have been going wrong the whole time. So in all of Act 2, the protagonist has been trying to solve problems the wrong way. Um, but they haven't realized that the real way to solve the problem is to, you know, confront their darkest true self or their real identity. So because of their, their fatal flaw or, or lack, it might be something they believe or something they're holding on to. It might be some unresolved trauma, but they keep making mistakes. They keep digging their own grave. They keep making, like, hurting people around them. So there's this, even though they're trying to do good and be better and change things, um, there's this self-destructive pattern in Act 2 that they don't fully realize. Um, and it shouldn't be too obvious, but, you know, it should kind of be there. And so one of the things that can happen in, in 20 is that the fatal flaw is brought to the surface a little bit. Um, I don't like to say, I don't think that this is when they um, heal the fatal flaw. I think maybe they become aware of it um, and they may think that they've overcome it, but actually they haven't. Um, but it, they have, at least they think they're solving some kind of a problem so that they have the confidence to seize the sword and continue in 21. So even though there's a very slim chance of success, um, the ally might tell them what's at stake or remind them what's important. Um, it might give the protagonist, you know, some kind of an insight into their true identity or their role. Sometimes they'll be given like a magic um, object as kind of an external symbol of them filling this fatal flaw. I wouldn't make it like super obvious, um, but they, they've given something that kind of relates to the flaw enough that they um, feel more confident and then they continue. This would be um, a good place to have some kind of critical hidden information. Maybe somebody says something um, and they interpret it a certain way and that gives them the confidence and then later they find out they didn't really get it right. So they seize the sword, um, they go back, they try again, they gear up to the final battle. There might need to be things that happen, like maybe they have to go and get some special weapon or they have to gather the troops or forces. There might be some kind of a, um, a battle 
speech to rile up the troops. But it's not just going to be a quick and easy um, win. Actually, once they go and they confront the antagonist again, this is 22. This is like the main confrontation, direct confrontation with the main um, antagonist, but the villain triumphs. I'm actually going to move this fatal flaw um, down here, even though I think it should be kind of referenced up here so that it starts to bubble to the protagonist's awareness. They don't really get it. They think they get it. They think they've figured out everything, and they go into battle sort of confident. Maybe they think they've, you know, overcome their limitation or their weakness, but they go into battle with their fatal flaw anyway, and that's their undoing. So this is the all is lost moment. Sometimes this is the hero at the mercy of the villain scene. Often this is where the villain will give their gloating speech where they kind of fill in all the plot holes and um, tell the hero about all of their plans because they're going to kill the hero anyway and it doesn't matter. So this is a good place to kind of wrap up loose ends. They're also going to kind of lose um, all hope. Maybe they think some of their ally friends um, have been killed. Maybe they think the, the antagonist plan um, is going to go forward no matter what. There's nothing they can do to stop it. It could actually be um, the antagonist who points out their fatal flaw and really shows them, you know, you, you're so predictable. You've been making the same mistake over and over again. I knew exactly what you would do. So this is kind of like a humiliation scene where um, the villain is, is laughing at them or holding them at gunpoint, or has them tied up. And this is also where the hero may come to a real understanding of his own fatal flaw. So they might, um, it might have been hinted to up above, they might have kind of thought they got it before, um, but this is a full realization and understanding. And it could also just be um, a, a letting go. At this point, Maybe this was their protective armor, um, their emotional insecurity, whatever it was that was holding them back at this point. It doesn't matter because they realize, you know, they've lost the one they cared about the most. Um, whatever they had hoped for or dreamed about has been taken away from them. At the beginning, I talked about how they have a want um, versus a need. So this is possibly also where they give up their want. Their unexpected... Um, victory is going to come from a secret weapon or ability, a deep resolve. Um, like it could just be sometimes the, the villain says, why do you even resist? There's no point. It's hopeless. You can't possibly hope to beat me. And the hero will just resist anyway, even though there's no chance, even though it doesn't make any sense. Um, they're just going to refuse to be beaten. This could be self-destructive behavior. Maybe the, the villain doesn't think the hero is capable of a sacrifice, um, or maybe because of the fatal flaw, the, the villain thinks the hero isn't capable of doing something. But um, at this point, the hero removes the glass shard. So whatever has been holding them back, whatever their fatal flaw is, um, the hero now figures it out. They have a new understanding of themselves, um, and they know exactly what's, what that thing is, what that um, unhealed wound is, um, and they decide to let it go, or they decide you know, to move beyond it. And it could also be a sacrifice. So like I said about um, there's a need versus a want, the whole book, they've wanted something. Um, and all the stuff that happened in Act 2, they were trying to get that thing. They were trying to get closer to that thing. So here, when all hope is lost, there's no chance of them ever getting that thing they can sacrifice it. They can just decide, well, okay, I'm not going to get that thing, but I'm going to fight the antagonist anyway. This could also be an unlikely ally. Maybe something they did earlier or someone they helped earlier. In Star Wars, Luke confronts his father, Darth Vader, and he thinks that he doesn't get through to him, um, and he's not strong enough to change his mind. But at the last moment, Darth Vader uh, does betray the dark side in order to save Luke. In Harry Potter, much earlier, um, they had saved Dobie the house elf, and suddenly Dobie the house elf becomes a really crucial, influential figure um, in the last big battle. So sometimes um, 
there's some sort of a sacrifice. It probably involves the hero removing the glass shard or coming to a new understanding of themselves. Um, but it could also just be, you know, in James Bond, they would just have a, a secret weapon that they got in the beginning from Q. It would be one cool little gadget. Um, and this would be that last scene where the villain thinks he's won, and then the hero just has some extra little um, unexpected thing to get him out of trouble. So they've won the day, they've won the battle, um, and they would go into a better, bittersweet reflection. If this is part of a series, they're not really going to defeat the antagonist, and this may not even be the main antagonist. This could just be one of the sidekicks um, or the smaller bad guys, if it was book one. But they've foiled the antagonist's um, plans, and they've saved somebody, some innocents. They've, they've stopped the bad things from happening. In Romance, the final battle is when they actually confess their feelings, and for just a minute there's um, this long pause where they don't know whether or not the love interest is going to reciprocate their feelings. Or they think they are too late and the airplane is already left, but then the love interest stay behind. So if this was a, a standalone book, um, I would actually have like a joyful celebration at the end of the last chapter because they've won. Um, but because I like to write series, I tend to have bittersweet reflections where, you know, they think about how far they've come. They might circle back to the beginning. They might have like a special precious object that reminded them of their former self or the want um, that they always you know, have been clinging on to, but now that they've given it up, now that they've changed and they no longer want the same things because they're not the same person, there might be like a deliberate letting go scene, um, or it could be an acknowledgement um, ceremony. So I have like a, a chapter 25, A Death of Self. This is an optional um, final chapter. The Bittersweet Reflection is probably like a mourning the lost comrades or um, they're just exhausted over all their ordeals, so they might be healing. It might be like a filling in the gap scene where, you know, someone, now that, you know, they've had this final battle um, and survived it, maybe they're in the hospital, somebody else comes and fills them in on all the information that they've missed. This is a really good place to plug up on any extra um, final plot holes. And so this last one doesn't have to be its own um, chapter, but I think it can be a pretty strong one. It's kind of just a coming of, coming full circle. Um, it's a rebirth of the self as a different person. So they've shifted from ambition to service. Before, they always wanted their own thing. They were trying to get the thing they wanted, um, and they've given that thing up to save other people or to defeat the antagonist. In a romance, they've always tried to get what they wanted, and they have decided to give up what they wanted um, because they love the other person, the love interest, and so they decide to focus on, you know, the other person instead and putting the other person's needs first. But it represents a really big shift. Um, so they're not the person they used to be. They're a new person now. Sometimes there's an acknowledgement ceremony, especially like in fantasy, um, where they might get, you know, called up to stage. They might get an award. There's public recognition of their service. And then if this is a series, there might be something like an optional hints of future challenges or the antagonist lives. So maybe just like a little vignette scene of the antagonist forces um, rebuilding or escaping or just living on to, to fight another day. So I hope this has been really useful, especially with NaNoWriMo um, coming up soon. I think this is a new way to plot that's based on a lot of other stuff, but a little more in-depth than what I've already seen out there. I'll make this available on creativity.com. You can look me up down there. Um, and I'll put up that Word document that I made also, so you can use that as a template if you want to. You can also download um, the plot dot, which is free. There's a PDF of it on my website somewhere. Um, and the idea of the plot dot was a visual guide to storytelling, so I focus a little more on um, mapping out scenes visually. But there's also a little bit more character building um, and some paragraph explanations of each of these main eight points. If this was useful for you, uh, please share it. Please leave a comment and let me know if you liked it. Um, this is something that I think will be really easy for you to share on social media or whatever. If you do, you could tag me down here at Creativity. And best of luck with your book or novel.